Chapter 19. Kill the President. This time, I really rather be alone. Can we forget this? I can just go home. This time, I really rather be alone. Stupid. 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 Izuku stared listlessly at his computer screen, barely registering the image that he was supposed to be editing. He glanced over at his phone for the umpteenth time that morning, its lack of notifications no longer a surprise. He should have known that things would turn out like this. How could he have expected anything different? Katsuki had said that he wasn't looking to date right from the start. Despite everything, though, Izuku continued to hope that Katsuki would reach out to him. He'd guiltily entertained more than a few fantasies since their fight a couple of days ago, fantasies where Katsuki would call or message him, asking him for forgiveness. Izuku wasn't sure whether he even wanted to forgive him at this point, but he'd hoped that Katsuki would at least try. The longer the silence stretched on, however, the more and more obvious the truth became. Katsuki wasn't going to call. Izuku sighed. He needed to accept that this was it. He wasn't doing himself any good by hovering over his phone. Izuku picked up the device and dropped it into his workstation drawer. Out of sight, out of mind. Something about the action felt too final though, and before he knew it, his eyes were tearing up. He angrily swiped at his face. From somewhere behind him, Izuku heard the sharp click of heels. Seconds later, he felt a tap on his shoulder. Izuku turned in his chair and found himself face to face with an irate Yuriko Okako. Even in his distressed state Izuku had the sense to cower before her ferocious glare. Ochako pursed her lips and crossed her arms. Midoriya Izuku, she said. Welcome back. Izuku winced. Ochako. Ochako held up a finger to silence him. Oh no, mister. Don't you Ochako me. I have some words for you and you're not going to like them. She took a breath, centering herself. I offered to help you. I told you to let me know if you needed anything while you were in the hospital. Why couldn't you even be bothered to tell me that you were back at work? I had to find out from Denki, of all people. How is it that a freelancer knew but I didn't? It was too much for Izuku. He felt his lip tremble as he tried to form a halfway decent response. Okako, I. Izuku. Ochako's glare softened. Her eyes scanned Izuku's face. Izuku looked away. Ochako sighed. She placed a hand on Izuku's cheek. Honestly. What am I going to do with you, she said. I'm not happy, but this is hardly something worth getting yourself worked up over. Izuku saw the genuine concern plastered on Ochako's face and was racked with shame. He pushed her hand away and buried his face in his palms. I'm sorry. Ochako, he spluttered. I can't do this. Can't do what? Ochako asked. What's wrong? Is it your head? Do you need? Stop, Izuku begged. It, it's not my head. It's not you. It's me. Ochako's nervous laughter filled the spacious studio. I don't know what. I'm sorry, Izuku wept. Everything got out of hand so fast. I really thought we had a chance. He really seemed to like me. He Izuku, who are you talking about? Ochako asked exasperatedly. Ka-chan. Izuku cried out. It's always been Ka-chan. God, I hate that so much. What? Okako paused as she attempted to piece things together. The guy from that band? What does he have to do with? He called me pathetic, Izuku sobbed. When I told him how I felt. A deadly silence fell over the room. When Izuku finally raised his head, Okako was staring at him with a pained expression. Oh, she said. Her eyes began to take on a shiny appearance. You're. Oh. The dreadful realization of what he'd done dawned on Izuku. Ochako he said weakly. Ochako shook her head. Don't, she said. 
Her lips wavered and she pressed them into a thin line. It's fine. I'm, a tear slipped over her waterline and rolled down her cheek. She turned and fled from the studio. Izuku wanted to call after Ochiko, to ask her to wait, but he couldn't force the word past his throat. He put his head down on his desk and wrapped his arms around himself. He deserved this. Izuku dragged himself home from work that night. While commuters happily chattered about their weekend plans, Izuku sat quietly, lost in his own thoughts. When Izuku finally arrived home, he flopped onto his bed. He stared at the ceiling, unable to get Ochiko's anguished expression out of his head. Izuku watched the minutes tick by on his phone. He knew that he ought to do something other than lying around and feeling sorry for himself. His eyes passed over the camera bag on his desk, his camera nestled safely within. He was struck with the sudden impulse to pick it up and throw it out the window. He wanted to scream. He wanted to cry. He wanted to break something. Izuku pressed his palms into his eyes. He needed to talk to somebody. Not Shouto, Izuku wouldn't be able to bear the knowing expression on his friend's face after he'd explicitly warned him against Katsuki. Besides, Izuku already knew who he wanted to talk to more than anyone else in the world. He just wasn't sure whether he was ready to tell her everything. Izuku ferociously chewed on his lip until it began to bleed. The unpleasant tang brought him back to the present and urged him to make a decision. With shaking hands, Izuku picked up his phone and scrolled through his contacts. He almost changed his mind twice before he finally pressed call. The phone rang twice before the receiver answered it. Izuku. Izuku took a shaky breath. Hi, mom. Sweetie. What's wrong? That was all it took. Izuku broke down, semi-coherent thoughts flooding out of him between wet sobs. He told his mother everything. He told her about the band, about Katsuki. He told her about his aspirations, about his camera. He told her about everything that he and Katsuki had done together. He told her about the things that Katsuki had said to him, about how much it had hurt. He told her about what he'd done to Ochiko. Izuku had no idea how long he rambled on for, but by the time he ran out of steam, he was exhausted. Inko hadn't spoken a single word the entire time. The longer that she remained silent, the more that Izuku's old fears began to creep back into his heart. He swallowed, hoping that he hadn't made a terrible mistake. Eventually Inko spoke. Izuku. Yeah yeah. Izuku whispered. Come home. Here. Take one. Izuku helped himself to a still warm muffin off the small plate that his mother held out to him. Inko had retrieved the muffins from the oven not ten minutes earlier. He took a bite, the half-melted chocolate chip stuck to the roof of his mouth in a familiar way that reminded him of his childhood. Inko sat down next to Izuku on the couch. She set the plate of muffins on top of the coffee table then poured tea from a steaming pot into two teacups. She handed one to Izuku. I've always found tea to be soothing, she murmured. Izuku brought the teacup to his mouth and inhaled. She wasn't wrong, something about the earthy scent comforted him. I'm sorry for dumping everything on you, he muttered quietly. Inko chuckled. No need to apologize. You've been this way since you could speak. I'm well used to it. Still, Izuku said. His stomach twisted unpleasantly. This, must be a lot to take in. Inko paused, her teacup half raised to her mouth. How do you mean? Izuku grimaced and looked away. Inko hadn't spoken much since they'd arrived home, and she'd remained quiet while she was busying herself in the kitchen. Izuku had tried to give her space to process everything, but the silence was becoming unbearable. I don't know, he said. 
I can understand if you feel upset or disappointed. Inka reached over and took her son's hand. Izuku, she said. Izuku raised his eyes reluctantly to meet his mother's. Inko squeezed his hand tightly. You are my son, she said. I love you more than anything else in the world. There is nothing that you could tell me that would ever change that. Her gaze softened. I know that I can be a warrior, but ultimately I just want you to be happy. Whoever that may be with. Izuku could feel his eyes watering before his mother had even finished speaking. He lunged forward and enveloped her in a crushing hug. I'm sorry I waited so long, he whimpered into her shoulder. I wanted to tell you sooner. I tried to push it away for so long, but I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore, I'm sorry, I just couldn't. Inko rubbed soothing circles into her son's back. SHH, it's okay, she whispered into his hair. Don't cry. It's okay. Izuku held his mother for a long time, taking comfort in her acceptance. Eventually Inko pulled away. You know, ever since you received that camera, I thought that there was something you weren't telling me, she said. She smiled even though her face was damp. Mother's intuition, I suppose. Izuku tried to laugh but it came out as a wet burble. He sniffled and wiped his nose on his sleeve. Inko looked at her son with fondness. You and I will always have two things in common, she said. We'll always be prone to waterworks and we'll always wear our hearts on our sleeves. Izuku pulled his mother in for another hug. I love you, he whispered. I love you too, baby, Inko soothed. She patted Izuku's back gently. I think there's been quite enough tears for now, though. Let me reheat this tea. I'm certain it's lost all its heat. Izuku released his mother. While she busied herself with the tea, he retreated to the bathroom and washed his face. Let me make dinner tomorrow, Izuku said when he returned. Inko glanced up from the kitchen stovetop. As much as I'd love you to stay, I'd prefer it if you didn't burn down my kitchen, she said. I've gotten better. Izuku defended. Trust me. I haven't set anything on fire in ages. An amused smile curled the corners of Inko's mouth. Okay, then, she said. I'll hold you to that. Izuku grinned. It's a date, he told her. Izuka rubbed his eye tiredly as he scrolled through a series of photographs on his computer. He selected two of his favorites from his interview with Monoma and attached them to a new email. It had taken time, but eventually Izuka began to heal. Coming out to his mother hadn't taken the pain of losing Katsuki away, but it had reminded Izuka of the people in his life who loved and supported him unconditionally. With newfound determination, he buried himself in his work. Katsuki may have given him the initial kick in the ass, but Izuku's dreams had always been his own. His head improved by the day, allowing him to work longer hours. He began to take on side jobs again. He spoke with Kenda regularly, interviewing and photographing whoever she sent his way. He continued to go on walks and look for inspiration. He began to write. Izuku had never been a journalist, but he'd taken several writing courses in college. During that time he'd gained a basic sense of how to craft a story. Where he lacked, his friends were happy to help out. Aitza had been surprisingly supportive despite working in the public sector, and his advice had been invaluable. When Izuku wasn't writing, he would spend hours reviewing his photographs. He'd reorganize them again and again, trying to figure out which images told the best story. As the weeks flew by, Izuku became more and more entrenched in his project. Kiri's Hima and Mina messaged him every once in a while. Jiro, too. At first it was primarily to encourage him and Katsuki to talk to each other, to make up. Like hell, Izuku was done. He'd moved on to bigger and better things. Eventually they got the message and gave up. 
Izuku had debated what he ought to do with the camera for a long time. Even now he felt a sharp pang in his chest whenever he looked at it. He could have given it away, sold it, or destroyed it. In the end though, he'd decided to keep it. Even if he wasn't thrilled about it, he needed the camera. It didn't make sense for him to punish himself, especially when he'd finally saved enough money to buy a lens. Izuku attached the opening paragraphs of his article to the email as well before he sent it off to Kendu for approval. She'd been great at filling in the gaps in Izuku's memory caused by his head injury. Manoma's trial was coming up soon, she'd told him. With any luck he'd be off with a fine and community service and then he'd be back to his old ways. The thought made Izuku smile. Izuku browsed through the images on his computer, now in the thousands. His hand froze when he stumbled across his old photos of the anti-heroes. He'd been waffling over whether he wanted to include them in his article. A pettier side of him told him not to, but his more logical side told him that they were important to the story. Izuku scrolled through a couple of the images. His chest tightened when he landed on his photograph of Katsuki in mid-scream, the stage lights blasting through his hair. Izuku hated how much it still hurt, how much he missed him. They hadn't spoken in well over a month, he shouldn't be feeling this way anymore. He shouldn't be struggling to find his happiness. Izuku closed the folder. He took a moment to collect himself before he turned his attention to his website. Let me assist you today. Senior photographer Togata Mirio looked up from his viewfinder, his eyebrows raised in mild surprise. Excuse me. He asked. Izuku met Mirio with a determined stare. I've accomplished my work for the day, he said. I've observed multiple cover shoots in studio. Let me assist you. Mirio crossed his arms. What's brought this on all of a sudden? I, Izuku debated how much he ought to tell Mirio. Mirio was well liked in the studio and he seemed like a trustworthy guy but that didn't mean that he should divulge more detail than necessary. I've worked here for two years, Izuku said. I'm a good photographer, but I'm not going anywhere. I want to take on more responsibility. Even if... Even if others don't want me to. Mirio considered. You're going behind Takeyama's back, he said. Izuku nodded slowly. He knew that it was a long shot. Mirio was one of their boss's favorites and easily the highest profile photographer in the studio, which was precisely why Izuku needed to get in with him. She won't be happy if she finds out about this, Mirio said. I know, Izuku replied. He clenched his fists. I'm prepared to take that risk. Besides, what's the worst she could do? Demote me. Mirio frowned momentarily but then his eyes brightened and his mouth split into a wide grin. You've got spunk, Midoriya, he exclaimed. He laughed jovially and slapped Izuku on the back. Sure, why not? I could use an extra pair of hands today. Izuku perked up. Really? Mirio's eyes danced. Really? I've had my eye on you, you know. Your new website looks great. Izuku startled. You've seen it, he squeaked. It's only been up for a few days, it's a small studio. Photographers talk. Mirio winked. Don't worry. I've only heard good things about you. Now, can you grab me an umbrella light and set it up? I'll need a beauty dish as well. Right away. Izuku responded eagerly. Thank you. He dashed off. Izuku spent the rest of the day making sure that he was the best damn assistant that Mirio had ever had. When he returned home that night, his feet were aching and his head was spinning, but he was grinning from ear to ear. How's your project coming along? Shouto asked. Really well. 
Izuka responded. He smiled at Shouto from across the diner table. I have more photos than I know what to do with. The hardest part has been narrowing them down. He shoved a couple of fries into his mouth. I've gotten Manoma's and most of the others' approvals for their mentions in the article. I'm starting to feel really good about it. The only thing I'm still struggling with is coming up with a good title. Shouto took a careful sip of his float. Do you have any ideas? Nothing that's really stuck with me, Izuku admitted. He sighed. I know I want the title to be something impactful, but everything either seems too obvious or too vague. Shouto nodded and rested his cheek on his fist. He eyed Izuku warily. How are you doing, he asked finally. Izuku sighed. He twiddled his thumbs. I've been keeping myself busy, he said. I haven't had time to dwell on things. Is that good? Shouto asked. It's been good for my project, Izuku replied. He put his elbows on the table and leaned forward, closing his eyes. He told Shouto everything in the end, and to his friend's credit, he'd barely brought it up since. I don't know. It's been hard, Todoroki. I'm doing my best. Shouto fell into contemplative silence. Do you think meeting someone else might help? Izuku opened his eyes, regarding Shouto suspiciously. Shouto shifted uncomfortably. I'm not really the type to set people up, he said. His cheeks began to redden. I have, an acquaintance. He's working on his PhD, like me. He's smart, and he seems like a nice guy. I think you'd get along. I... I showed him your picture, and he expressed interest. In a matter of seconds Shouto's face had become scarlet. I could give you his number if that's okay, Izuku said. He watched the color fade from Shouto's face as he sagged in what Izuku assumed was embarrassed relief. I appreciate it, Todoroki, but I think I want to focus on my work for now. Shouto nodded. Understandable, he said. His face returned to its usual impassive expression. About your project though. Do you think I could see it? Izuku blinked. Uh. Okay. He unlocked his phone and sent Shouto the latest draft of the article along with a few of his edited pictures. He squirmed self-consciously as Shouto looked through the files. These are your photographs. Shouto asked, his eyebrows rising slightly. There, really good, Midoriya. Izuku stopped squirming. Shouto had never been one to give false compliments. You think so, he asked. Shouto nodded. He continued to scroll through his phone. The article isn't done yet, Izuku said, his face heating up. I'm still working on it. I have a long way to go before. Midoriya. Izuku stopped talking. Shouto closed his eyes. He remained silent for a full minute. When you're finished, send the final files to me. I'll pass them along to my father. Izuku gaped at Shouto. Todoroki, he exclaimed. Please don't feel like you have to do that for me. I know that you aren't on speaking terms with your father. I'll pass them along to him, Shouto repeated. Your work, it deserves to be seen. Izuku was left speechless. Shouto's father, Todoroki Enji, was the owner of one of the largest media conglomerates in the country. His empire included newspapers, broadcast media, magazine publishing, and entertainment websites. However, Shouto's tense relationship with his father had made Izuku abandon that potential contact years ago. Todoroki, Izuku's hands trembled. I don't know what to say. Don't say anything yet, Shouto said. I can't guarantee that he'll look at it, and I don't know whether he'll like it. It's pretty out there. But I'll send it to him. Izuku hung his head. He didn't deserve his friends. How could he have ever thought that they didn't approve of his dreams? Thank you, Todoroki. I'll make it up to you, somehow. Make it up to me by giving this project your all, Shouto said. 
A small smile formed at the corners of his mouth. Izuku felt his eyes water. Yes. He nodded and set his jaw. I'll do that. Izuku scanned his article and photographs for the hundredth time. A title. A title was all he needed. He scrutinized his opening photograph, an image of AI, disheveled and unimpressed, sitting in front of her Oscar Wilde wall mural. The next image was of Manoma. He was wearing his rumpled prison clothes, arms crossed as he regarded the camera with an air of superiority. We are the citizens, and if the system does not work for us, then the system does not work. These were the words spoken by Manoma Nieto on the cold winter morning of January 12, 2019. He's standing outside one of the city's local police stations, surrounded on all sides by people from every walk of life. People who are holding banners. People with white plastic buckets. People who are angry. Manoma is currently being held at the South Bank Detention Center. Izuku scrolled down. He passed a photograph of Kendu and Manoma's anarchist group, masks obscuring their faces, and a photograph of another one of AI's murals. That's the thing about the world we live in, AI says, taking a long drag on her cigarette. Nobody cares about your art unless they can find a way to monetize it. Sad, ain't it? She pauses. Companies LL steal your message, dilute it, and sell it back to the masses under the guise of progress. Look at how divergent we are, they'll proudly say while they shove a bottle of Pepsi down your effing throats. AI shakes her head in disgust and puts her cigarette out on the sidewalk. The only true divergents are the ones who are willing to suffer for their art. Izuka rapidly scrolled past a photograph of the antiheroes in concert and several images of the other punk bands he'd photographed more recently. In the end he'd decided to include them. As much as he hated to admit it, the bands were a critical component of his project. If you're brave enough to look, their message is everywhere. They're challenging us to give a damn, to get mad. They're screaming about the failures of our justice system, the problems created by a capitalist society, the hatred marginalized people experience simply for existing. They refuse to be downtrodden even while playing in dingy nightclubs and filthy dives at 10 bucks a gig, sometimes less. It's hard not to think that they deserve more. That they deserve to be heard. It had ended up being a substantially sized article. Izuku hummed thoughtfully as he schemed through his other interviews, personal observations and reflections on society. Maybe it's time for all of us to get a little angry. To stand up and demand better. The people are disgruntled. They're defiant. Some of them are violent. They also care for their world far more deeply than I ever could have imagined. Regardless of how you view their actions, you can't deny their heart. The message that Manoma was sending as he tossed a bucket of red paint over that officer's head was far more meaningful than the action itself, I care. What do you care about? Izuka rubbed his eyes. His project had boiled down to 28 of the best photographs he'd ever taken and 3,000 words of text that had been rewritten and edited more times than he could count. He'd even paid a professional copy editor to review the final draft. Izuku looked through his photographs again. He thought about the people he'd included, the messages that were contained within his images. Disobedience, in the eyes of anyone who has read history, is man's original virtue. Resist. Not my culture. The wheels in Izuku's head began to turn. He returned to the beginning of his article and moved his mouse to the top of the page. Cultural resistance, the merits of public disobedience in the modern era. Izuku smiled. He gave his story a final once over. He made sure that the captions for each photograph were perfect. That each image was as clear and high quality as possible. With his stomach in knots, Izuku composed an email to Shouto. He uploaded his final files to a secure transfer site. Months of hard work had culminated into this specific point in time. He clicked send. 
Izuka reviewed the media list that he'd painstakingly collected. He'd give it a few days to see if Endeavor Enterprises took interest, and if not, he'd blast his project to every other major news outlet in the city. He had a feeling that he wouldn't be sleeping much until he'd heard back from someone. Putting something so intensely personal into the public realm was terrifying. He prayed that someone would want to pick it up. Izuka closed his files. His project was completed. He wished he could have told Katsuki. Izuku spent the following afternoon worming his way into another assistant role with Mirio. Running around on set proved more difficult than usual after tossing and turning all night. Nevertheless, he'd been delighted when Mirio had let him operate the camera while they were conducting test shots and for a short portion of the shoot itself. When Izuku returned to his workstation, he noticed that a number of the studio's photographers had crowded around one of the nearby computers. The girls were pointing at something on the screen, muttering and shushing each other in turn. It's only been out for two days and look at the numbers on it. It's definitely going viral. He's so handsome. Who hurt him? His voice is so sexy. God, just listen to it. Wonder if he sounds like that in bed. One of the girls squealed in protest. Izuku didn't think much of it. They were probably watching some new cover of a popular song. As Izuku sat down at his desk, one of the girls glanced his way. Hey, Midoriya, she said. Have you seen this yet? Seen what? Izuku asked distractedly. She beckoned Izuku over. Izuku hesitated until the whole group joined in, at which point he could no longer ignore them. He got up from his desk and approached the workstation, squeezing into the middle of the group. He peered at the video on screen. His heart dropped out of his chest. 